Thanks, guys. Good morning. How are you doing? My name's Eric. Get to be the pastor here again to say just welcome to everyone in the room, uh, as well as everyone watching online, Stapletons, Rashes, Dan and Shay. Uh, my wife, Kristen, I know, is watching online, Melissa Morgan, um, Kelly, uh, anyone else I miss? Sorry. Hey, good to see you all watching online. Glad you could be with us uh, here today, whether you're in person or online. Let me tell you a love story this morning as we get going in our series, Redeeming Love. But before I tell you a love story, would you join me in prayer? God, thank you that you are here in this place. You are with us. Be with us now as we dive into Ruth chapter 3. Let each of us receive from you, from your word, what it is that we most need to receive. In your name we pray. Amen. I grew up with only sisters, no brothers. Anyone else in that same? Uh, yeah, yeah, there we go. So what happens is oftentimes you get outvoted for watching TV shows and movies. So instead of maybe watching you know, something action-packed, you end up watching a lot of what are called romantic comedy movies. And I have to admit, I'm kind of a sucker for romantic comedies. A good Meg Ryan movie does my heart Good, uh, or Serendipity, one of my favorite movies. Uh, yes, I did grow up watching Anna Green Gables and Laura Ingall Wilder and all those shows. So I've always had a soft spot for love stories. So I just want to tell you a little bit about a love story this morning. When I went to college, I was dating my high school sweetheart, and we went off to college, two different colleges, but I knew she wasn't the right one, but I wanted to let her down easily. However, I didn't want to break up because we had tickets to go see the great Garth Brooks in concert. And then we got into a fight a week before the concert, and she said, do you want to break up with me? And I was like, uh, yes, but I want to go to the concert. We ended up breaking up. I still never seen Garth Brooks in concert. <laughs> Sophomore year of college, I started dating another nice young woman. We date for two years in college, but not the right one. Senior year, date different girls, not the right one. And I'm eventually graduate from Bible school. And if you don't know this, a lot of times Bible school tell you ring by spring or your money back. And at that spring of graduation, no ring. And I was like, oh no, where am I going to find a nice young lady now I'm leaving college? And so I graduate actually single and still feeling like, God, what is going on? Where, where, I want to find a wife. Uh, I'm a very romantic guy. I, I've been looking, I've been looking, I've been doing my part. But what I learned is walking by faith has two parts to it. Part of us stepping into action, but also we have to be dependent on the actions of others. Amen? And so what I didn't realize was that God had prepared someone for me, my lovely wife, Kristen. But see, she's three and a half years younger. So when I went to college, she was still in high school in Colorado. And so I had to wait for her to come to, back to Minnesota for college and break up with her high school boyfriend so that when we met after I was in college and she was a sophomore, then it was the right time for us to get together. And here we are now. We've been married 16 years and four kids. And through that all, we've seen God was directing our steps. But see, I had to take action and ask her on that first date. But also, things had to be lined up for the right time for her. And then she also had to respond. We're going to see that in this story of Ruth, that there are times when we need to step out into action, step into faith, can't just sit back passively, but also there are times when we have to wait on others or on God's timing, amen? Uh, if you have your Bibles, you can turn with me to Ruth chapter 3, that's where we are uh, this week, and uh, we're going to be reading in the ESV version, otherwise I've got the, uh, the scriptures here. And you can follow along, whatever works best for you. And if you're taking notes, love to have you uh, join us taking notes on your note sheet this morning or if you're at home. Grab a piece of paper, write down a few thoughts. Then Naomi, her mother-in-law, said to her, My daughter, should I not seek rest for you? Rest is going to be a big word for this chapter. How many of you could use some good, deep, abiding rest for your body, mind, and soul. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, I think, God's will for each and every one of us this morning is to receive a little bit of rest. We've seen the story of Naomi and Ruth. Naomi from Bethlehem 
where Jesus eventually is going to be born. And she goes to another country, Moab. But then over there, she loses her husband. Her two sons marry two fine Moabite women. Then she loses her two sons. Now she's left just her two daughter-in-laws. One of the daughter-in-laws stays in Moab, but one, Ruth, says, hey, where you go, I will go. Your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. And she goes with her back to Bethlehem. Well, they are poor, destitute, but God has made provisions in the law of Moses that those who are from foreign countries, who are widows, who are poor, they can come alongside workers and glean in their fields, which means kind of pick up the leftovers. And so Ruth just happens to go to this field of Boaz, who is a kinsman of Naomi's husband who has passed away. And so things are going great, but at the end of chapter 2 last week, we saw that really two months goes by, and there's nothing going forward in the relationship between Boaz, this nice young man, the nice older man, and Ruth. So it's like, what are we going to do here? We've been waiting for something to happen for two months, and nothing's happening. So now Naomi, who, when we first uh, saw her back at Bethlehem, she's very, very depressed. She says, don't call me favored. Don't call me Naomi. Call me Mara, which means bitter. And I've lost so much. I'm empty. I'm bitter. But now her hope's been rekindled, and now Naomi is going to step into action. My daughter, should I not seek rest for you, that I may be well with you? Is not Boaz our relative with whose young women you were? See, he is winnowing barley tonight at the threshing floor. So most of us probably haven't grown up on farms. Maybe some of you did. My grandparents grew up on farms. But back then what they'd do is they, they would gather in the harvest and bring in the barley. And then they'd have these winnowing floors where they would get the grain and they'd toss it up and the chaff would go into the wind and, and be blown away. And then the good grain would be left there. Jesus talks about this in some of his parables, that at the end, God will separate the chaff from the wheat, and the chaff will be blown away, and the good seed will be, be left there. And so now Boaz, as a good owner, it's like they're in that, that busy season of work. And so we, we learned last week, Boaz, he, he's a great boss, great owner uh, of his fields, and he blesses his workers. And now he's going to be in the fields at this time of winnowing, uh, to gather in the final kind of their, their crop. And so he, he's with them. And Naomi knows Boaz is a man of good character and that he's going to be with his workers and actually even sleeping there in the winnowing area. And she says, Wash therefore and anoint yourself and put on your cloak and go down to the threshing floor, but do not make yourself known to the man until he has finished eating and drinking. So now Naomi's going to put together kind of a good plan here. So in this culture, they didn't bathe and take showers every day. It's more of a special occasion. She's like, hey, the timing is right. We know where Boaz is going to be. And so what I want you to do is take a shower, get washed, put some perfume on, put on a good cloak. Perhaps, perhaps Ruth has still been wearing a widow's clothes, maybe wearing black. And, it, and Naomi's like, hey, it's time to take off those widow's clothes. And show Boaz that, hey, you're available uh, for marriage. Wash yourself, put on some perfume, put on some good clothes, and then go down to the threshing floor where we know he's going to be. But don't make yourself known until he's finished eating and drinking. So, like, wait for the opportune time. So this is where we need to take action, but sometimes we have to have the wisdom to know when is the right time to take action. Naomi goes on to say, But when he lies down, observe the place where he lies. Then go. And uncover his feet and lie down, and he will tell you what to do. And she replied, all that you say, I will do. All right. So this sounds super weird, right? Like if you're new to the Bible, maybe some, one of those sections you just read and skip. All right. Bible commentaries, they're kind of mixed on what exactly here is going on. It seems like this was a relatively common courting technique where uh, you'd come up to a guy and you'd uncover his feet, and then you'd lay down next to his legs, feet kind of area. So keep that in mind. We're not sure exactly what's going on, but it's a little charged here. It's like a, uh, you know, it, it, it's basically like a good Hallmark Christmas movie where there's some sparks going on. Nothing too scandalous, but it's a little, yeah, yeah. you know. So here we go. What we're going to learn, though, is that walking in faith requires both action and waiting. Both action and waiting. 
So I think some of us are, have a propensity towards action. We jump in, and then it's like, hey, this is what I'm going to do, God. Bless it as I'm going. And, you know, they talk about building a new business, planting a church. These things are like building an airplane, you know, while it's in flight. And you're like figuring out how to build the cockpit and the fuselage while you're up in the air. Some of us are, have a propensity for that, for action. Some of us have a propensity to just sit back and wait and not do anything. Because it's like, oh, God's got it, God's got it. Well, but God has given you free will and a mind. And here, here's something that may sound super, super sacrilegious to some of you. God's will isn't the only one at work in our world. See, God gave each and every one of us free will, agency to act. There are also other spiritual beings in our world that have free will and agency to act. Now, God is sovereign. God is king. No one can supersede his will. But he has given us the ability to choose and act. And so, trusting and waiting on God doesn't mean never taking action. There are times when we need to step into faith and like Naomi, say, hey, it's time. Take off those widow's clothes. Take a shower. Put on some perfume. And take this next step. Then we're going to see, though, Ruth does her part, but then she has to sit and wait on Boaz and on someone else outside of their little circle. Who we have to wait on, on what, he, what is he going to do? We want to trust and walk by faith like Jesus. Amen? And so what we need is the wisdom to know when to act, when to wait. When to act, when to wait. This is why I implore you, please make studying God's word a daily habit. That's how we're going to grow in wisdom. By opening up his word, growing in it, the more we get to know this love letter that God has for us to tell us how to think, how to act, the kind of person to become, the more then we will know when to act, when to wait. When to act, when to wait. To spend time in prayer, talking to your Heavenly Father. As you talk to Him, as you allow the Holy Spirit to be the dominant influence in your life, you'll sense those nudgings. You'll see just where God is leading you. When to act, when to wait. When to act, when to wait. Let's read on in the text. So she went down to the threshing floor, this is Ruth, and did just as her mother-in-law had commanded her. And when Boaz had eaten and drunk, and his heart was merry, he went to lie down at the end of the heap of grain. Then she came softly and uncovered his feet and lay down. At midnight, the man was startled and turned over, and behold, a woman lay at his feet. Now, Boaz is probably closer in age to Naomi than Ruth. So here's maybe a middle-aged guy, working hard all day, had a good dinner, had a little wine, he's laying down. All of a sudden he wakes up because his feet are uncovered. It's kind of windy, it's cold. And there's a woman at his feet. And he responds how probably, I think all of us would respond. Who are you? He can't see, it's dark. He's like, why is there a woman at my field? <coughs> now, we see in other parts of the Bible that the winnowing field at this time was kind of like truck stops nowadays where sometimes... Um, prostitutes would frequent those as, as, and come up and kind of try to solicit uh, sexual favors in exchange for money during this time. And so Boaz isn't sure. Is this a prostitute? Is this someone who's sketchy? I don't know. Who is this? And she answered, I am Ruth, your servant. Spread your kanaf or your wings over your servant for you are a redeemer. One thing we notice here, is how Ruth identifies herself, simply as his servant. In the previous chapter, Ruth identified as a foreigner. Hey, amazing that you would bless me, my Lord, a foreigner, that I'm a widow. You know, that she identifies all these things as someone from another country, you know, a, a widow, all these things she's been through. But now, how does she identify herself? What's her identity? She's simply Ruth, your servant. I think one of the things God wants us to see is you are so much more than just where you were born, where you were raised, your circumstances, the things that have happened to you. And as followers of Jesus, 
what Jesus wants us to see as our identity is a servant. Hey, I'm your servant. Spread your wings. This is what actually points to an Old Testament prophecy. Uh, uh, I believe it's uh, Malachi that said when the Messiah would come, there would be healing in his wings or his kanaf. And that was at the end of a rabbi's um, prayer shawl, his tassels. And this is, this is pointing to that story where the woman with the issue of blood for 12 years was bleeding and bleeding and nothing would heal her and she uh, lost all her resources and she reaches out and touches the wings, the kanaf, the edges of the garment of Jesus and then she's healed in an instant. I love this. this is Ruth pointing to Boaz as a kind of Jesus with healing in his wings. I love that. She says, you are a redeemer. You're someone who can marry me, fulfill the Leverite vow from the uh, Old Testament, and, and, and you can redeem me. And he says, may you be blessed by the Lord, my daughter. You have made this last kindness greater than the first, and that you've not gone after young men, whether poor or rich. Basically, what Ruth is saying by, hey, spread your kanaf, your wings, the corner of your garment over me. It's saying, hey, I'm asking you basically to marry me. I, I want to marry you and have you be my husband, my Lord, forever. And so Boaz now is kind of blown away. He's like, whoa, I'm an older guy. You're younger. I, I didn't know if I had a shot with you. He says, this last kindness of you coming to me and offering yourself to me as my bride. That's even greater than this first kindness that I heard about of you committing yourself to Naomi and to her welfare. Like, wow. He says, you haven't gone after other, other young men, more your age, whether they're rich or poor, but you're, you're giving yourself to me. This is amazing. First thing I think we want to learn here is to put ourselves at Jesus' feet. Ruth puts herself at the feet of Boaz and basically says, hey, I'm your servant. You tell me what to do. I am pledging myself to you. My social media of choice is Twitter. Uh, I know many of you love TikTok or Instagram or Facebook or whatever it might be. I like Twitter. I like words. I like the short and concise nature of it. A church planter friend <coughs> Uh, Plant in South Carolina. We actually met in person for the first time in Portland uh, in September. He was asking, you know, how do I teach my people in my church plant the theological truth of being unified in Christ? That when we choose to follow after Jesus, we are made one with him. And one of the examples people said, you know, is it, it is a lot like a marriage ceremony. That when you stand in front of everyone and say, hey, I forsake all others to give myself wholly, completely, and utterly to you. When we bow the knee to Jesus, it's not just a mental assent to certain list of beliefs saying, oh, yes, I believe that Jesus lived 2,000 years ago and he died on the cross for my sins. What is symbolized often through the act of baptism is saying, it's like standing in front of your friends and family at your wedding and saying, hey, I give myself wholly and exclusively to you, Jesus. You are my rabbi, teacher, husband, my master, my Lord. And so as Ruth does that to Boaz, that points forward to the day where Jesus invites us to do the same to him. To say, hey, Jesus, I am forsaking all other loves to put myself at your feet to say, hey, tell me what to do. I am your servant. That is what Ruth's saying to Boaz, and that's what Jesus invites us today. And it's a free gift. Jesus invites any and all to come in, no matter what sketchy past you might have. He welcomes all into this relationship with him. Let's read on, verse 11. He says, and now, my daughter, do not fear. And again, I just think, every time we read this, this command, it's just to highlight that. This is the most often used command in the Bible. Sometimes people say it's like 365 times in the Bible. I don't think that's exactly true. It's a nice idea, but I don't think it is. But it's, it is the most common commandment in the Bible. Maybe today that's just what you need to hear. 
do not fear. Now hear me. Doesn't mean don't be wise. Don't take stupid chances. Whether that's in your business or relationship or with your health. But do not fear. Fear cannot abide in the place where perfect love is. And Jesus says, my perfect love casts out all fear. You cannot be in the grip of fear and in the grip of Jesus' love at the same time. Now, we all have things that we're going to struggle with, fears, anxieties, worries. But this is where again and again we go to this place of saying, okay, I'm going to step into love and the grip of love that Jesus has for me. And I'm going to intentionally move out of fear into security and love of Jesus. But what it says is to Ruth, hey, do not fear. You've been through a lot. You came to a new country. You weren't sure how you're going to get fed. You didn't know what was going to happen, but do not fear. I will do for you all that you ask. I will marry you. I will redeem you. I will give you a hope and a future. For all my fellow townsmen, know that you are a worthy woman. She's high character. Second thing we're going to see is that your testimony speaks volumes. Your testimony speaks volumes. That your testimony is Jesus' letter to the world. See, Ruth, everyone in town knew. She had come with Naomi. She had pledged herself to Naomi. She had taken care of her mother-in-law. She worked hard. She was polite. She was kind. And Boaz says, hey, that speaks volumes. Everyone knows that you are worthy. You have high character. How we live matters, both in person as well as online. Your social media presence matters. Your social media presence is a letter representing Jesus to the rest of the world. Do you know that? How you treat your coworkers, your boss, the people that work for you, that's a letter to the world representing Jesus. How you treat your kids, your spouse, your testimony is telling the rest of the world about your relationship with Jesus and about your life. And how we live matters. It speaks volumes to the world. Uh, Verse 12. And now it is true that I am a redeemer, yet there is a redeemer nearer than I. There's a closer family relative. Remain tonight and in the morning. If he will redeem you, good, let him do it. But if he is not willing to redeem you, then as the Lord lives, I will redeem you. Lie down until the morning. So she lay at his feet until the morning, but arose before one could recognize another. And he said, let it not be known that the woman came to the threshing floor. Boaz is looking out for her reputation because it was known that sometimes prostitutes would come at this time and, and, and he says, nay, I don't want anyone to know that, that you were here at this time of, uh, you know, in the night. <coughs> and again, Ruth is really putting herself in the hands of Boaz. He could have sexually assaulted her. He could have taken advantage of her. He could have scoffed at her and said, what are you doing? How dare you propose yours to me? She took a big risk, a big step of faith in this, but she was rewarded. He's taking care of her. He's looking out for her. He's saying, hey, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to marry you. I'm going to do this thing. And he said, bring the garment that you are wearing and hold it out. Uh, it probably wasn't her dress that she's wearing. She probably had some kind of scarf on or something. Again, theologians kind of debate this. And, but she held it out. He measured out six measures of barley. Again, uh, Theologians kind of differ. It's somewhere between 30 and 60 pounds, perhaps, of grain, and put it on her. Then she went into the city. So he just pours out grain on her, blessing upon blessing upon blessing. And when she came to her mother-in-law, she said, how did you fare, my daughter? Then she told her all that the man had done for her, saying, these six measures of barley, again, like 30 to 60 pounds, he gave to me. For he said to me, you must not go back empty-handed to your mother-in-law. Do you remember how? How Naomi described herself when she arrived in chapter 1 back in Bethlehem. Don't call me Naomi. I'm Mara, for I am empty. So now the emptiness of Naomi is being filled by Boaz. 
And we're going to see that there is a heir that's going to come from Ruth and Boaz that's going to be actually in the line of Naomi. And everything that Naomi has lost, God is going to refill. And this is amazing, pointing back to that, her emptiness is being filled. Third thing, bless, bless, and then bless some more. Boaz had blessed Ruth in a big, big way. Early on, by letting her glean behind them and then even telling some of his workers, hey, pull up some sheaves for her, do some of the work for her. Inviting her to sit at the table at dinner with him, good Italian meal, some bread, dip it in the oil, some wine. And then now he's going to marry her. And, and then even then, he's given her this, all this grain. And so Boaz can use the bless and then bless and bless some more. I believe that's what God wants for each of us to be a blessing because we've been blessed, to bless and then bless and then bless some more. Now, each of us needs the wisdom to know what does that look like? We all can bless in different ways. Some of us, it's with a checkbook. Some of us, it's with encouraging words of sending that text message, writing that handwritten card, you know, showing up with a meal. Uh, maybe it's you know, volunteering at your kid's school, doing something for your kid's teacher, um, you know, just uh, seeing someone who's not normally seen. We all have different ways that we can bless. But the example of Boaz is just to bless, bless, and then bless some more. And then at the very end, Naomi says, wait, my daughter, until you learn how the matter turns out, for the man will not rest, but will settle the matter today. Remember the beginning? Naomi's seeking the rest of Boaz, and now she's, or the rest of Ruth. She's like, now Boaz will not rest until he gets this matter resolved. But it's out of Naomi's hands. It's out of Ruth's hands. And it's actually out of Boaz's hands. We're going to see next week in our concluding chapter, there's another redeemer, and he has first right of refusal. But Boaz is going to do whatever he can to convince this man, hey, I want to marry Ruth. So what we can see by this there are times we need to step into action and the times of waiting. Ruth took action. Naomi took action. She came up with a plan, sent Ruth down. Ruth stepped into action, took some risks, and now Boaz is going to step into action. Naomi, action first, and then she had to wait to see how Ruth was going to do and Boaz. Ruth steps into action. Now she's got to wait on Boaz. Boaz is going to step into action and then he's going to wait to see how this other redeemer is going to respond. It's a big idea this morning. We need the wisdom from God to know when to act, when to wait. When to act, and when to wait. And just because we're in a season of waiting doesn't mean we're not where we're supposed to be. When I was dating different girls and waiting for my bride, I didn't know Kristen was still in high school. And then she was dating her high school sweetheart. And I had to wait for her to get back to Minnesota to the right age. Sometimes what you're waiting on is not about you. It's on that other person. So then I, I've had to learn over and over again. Sometimes God has us in a season of waiting, but it's not actually about you. It's about someone else. It's about what God is doing in their life. And God is working on them to get into the right place where they need to be. I'm going to invite the band to come on up, and we're going to close with some worship. So this morning, I don't know where you're at, but Jesus invites all of us. We can sit at the feet of Jesus. We can lay all our worries, our fears, that thing that we're waiting on at his feet, and give it to him. Your testimony is going to speak volumes. How you live matters. And number three, bless, bless, and bless some more. As we sing this song, I want you to just pray. Is something I need to give over to Jesus? Is there some way I need to live differently? Because my life is not the kind of letter to the world that is representing Jesus the best. And pray for Jesus to reveal that. Hey, what is it that needs to change in my life? And how can you be a blessing? Is it with your checkbook? Is it with your time? Is it with your words? Is it <coughs> changing how you Use social media. Uh, we're going to sing this song. It's so actually we're going to do a response song. Then I'll come up, and then we'll receive the offering. Sorry about that.
Wendy. So this is a, a gift for you. You can stay seated if you like. And then uh, we're going to just sing the song. This is a time to just check in with Jesus. And then we'll do a closing song. Let me pray. And then the band's going to lead us in this song. God, thank you for the book of Ruth. Thank you for the truths that are found within there. And I just pray right now, God, that you would give us the wisdom to know when to act and when to wait. God, give us the wisdom to know the things that we need to lay at your feet to give over to you. The things in our life we need to change so that our testimony is a letter to the world that represents you well. And then God, how to be a blessing, how to be like Boaz and speak words of blessing to our work coworkers, to our neighbors, to our friends, to those weaker and less fortunate to us. Just reveal how, God, you want us to bless others in, in this season of, that we find ourselves in right now. Thank you, God. In your name we pray. Amen. Let's sing this song together.